Hey everybody, welcome back to Chris from Penguin 1990. My name is Matthew, and I just wanted to cover some things before I get into our other dating methods. Um, one, I've had a friend or two ask me why does it take so long to get these videos posted and everything, and the reason is is because I have to do a lot of research. Like this research is dealing with nothing but light, the speed of light. That's all it is. And you got to figure I've got textbooks and everything. I got to go through um, websites like National Graphic, Discovery, Scientific, and so on. And I have to condense all that into um, this for just a quick 30-minute uh, video. And it is a lot of information. So it takes me a while to condense it all, what's important, what's not important. And you have to condense it. And the other thing I wanted to do in this video is I wanted to cover quickly again why I have comments disabled. Now, before I started this channel, I decided, you know what, let me first go to creation um, YouTube channels and evolutionary YouTube channels and see how the comments are. Are they staying civil? Does it become this profanity battle? Do they um, make fun of each other? Do they, you know, get crude and rude with each other? Whatever. So I went to multiple creation YouTube channels and evolutionary channels and or atheist channels um, as well because there are some out there that um, have atheistic channels. And I'm sorry, but people that are supposed to be adults, even um, so-called Christians, every single one of them, not one was spared, every single one had profanity battles, they made fun of each other, they um, of course called each other names, they tried to bully each other, they even went so far as to use very vulgar anatomical analogies as to, well you're just doing this because you do this, you know, you get the idea without me actually explaining it. And I was like, you know what, I'm sorry, but I don't have time to keep that from happening on my channel because I work so much because we are right, we're shorthanded right now at work and I just don't have the time to deal with it so I decided the best thing to do is to keep the, dis the comments disabled but when I get all the videos posted I want to get um, like the creation versus evolutionism uh, videos the apologetic videos which we'll, I'll do after this we'll start um, in Genesis chapter 1 and go all the way to Revelation and some uh, in those videos then at the end of all those so I can concentrate on getting those done I will post a video and I'll give out an email and that email is just, is nothing um, but for y'all to send me your questions. And uh, the format I'd like for you to do is in the subject, put Bible question, creation versus evolution question. And in that way, I can, you know, differentiate the two and have a folder for one, folder for other. And I'll pick five from one and five from the other. And I'll make one video at a time to answer those. And I'm sure I'll get, you know, blasted with a bunch of them. So it'll take me forever like some of the others. But that's just the easiest way to do it but if if when I do that I will give these same rules again if you send me anything vulgar you will be blocked if you send me something cursing me out or using a bunch of profanity in your question or whatever you will be blocked if you send me something that's uh, making fun of myself or others just because of our viewpoint in God's Word and creation as a whole you will be blocked and apart from being blocked I will come back on my channel and say so and so apparently is still an elementary kid because they sent me something like this and they you know whatever I will call you out on it too and it's just I mean come on we're supposed to be adults here we can have civil conversations through um, in the email you can send me a civil question without cursing me out making fun of me or anybody else just ask a simple question and I will not respond to you directly on the email that's just so you can send me questions. I will answer questions here. So that way everybody can um, get something out of the question answers and so on. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to cover other dating methods. Now, the first thing we're going to cover in that is astronomical dating, which, of course, that comes from the speed of light um, being given in millions or billions of light years. But before we go any further, let me kind of go back over what a light year is because I know some people, like I said, haven't been in college or high school. For a while so one light year which excuse me I'm getting ahead of myself a light year is a distance not a time there are some that still confuse the two um, even today and I just wanted to cover that is a distance not a time now one light year just one is 5.879 times 10 to the 12th power miles or 9.4607 times 10 to the 15th power meters or 6.3241 times 10 to the fourth power in astronomical units. Now, let me stop there and cover this too. 
a lot of creationists will say just in miles per hour and so on and they get blasted like i said and they're like oh see they don't understand science because they they should know if they understood science it should be in the metric system and so we know it's supposed to be in the metric system but many americans are not used to metric they're used to miles per hour so we put it in terms that they are used to because they can reference that if you come out and start doing stuff like kilometers an hour gaming mirrors an hour so on, they might not understand you so they're just going to be sitting there and be bored because you're talking to stuff they don't understand and you need to reference your audience now if i let's say i was go to australia because some church over there wanted me to come out and talk about this well they're used to metrics so i'd use it in metric um if i go to a church here in america well they're used to the standard system in miles per hour so i would talk about it in miles per hour you, you just gotta use your frame of audience but since i'm doing youtube and it's going to hit both sides i'll say it in both so i just wanted to cover that briefly that's why you're going to hear me say in miles per hour or in kilometers and so on excuse me okay so these long ages for dating st mm, sorry i got hiccups today these long ages for dating starlight are based on the redshift theory and einsteinian theory of the nature of space or everybody knows as e equals mc squared both are beginning to become seriously questioned in the last few years by uh, both sides of science on um, the creation and the evolutionary side and uh, for the redshift theory i covered that in my video on the big bang or big dud and how there's different meanings behind the redshift and what other things could cause the redshifts that are being seen so definitely be sure to backtrack and check that video out because it covers that in better detail now the Einstein, Einstein's theory is the speed of light is constant at 186,000 miles per second or 299,274 kilometers a second. However, uh, many scientists are beginning to believe that the universe, ha or look at the universe, excuse me, with a Euclidean viewpoint or Pythagorean viewpoint. And the reason that viewpoint is important is because that is the speed of light is not actually constant light travel to us is shorter not longer and stars are a lot closer than they appear now i'm going to cover that in a bit but the speed of light not being constant and what they're saying is they're finding out that there's all this stuff in outer space that they can refer to as ether or a medium for it to go through like the gas pockets in the nebulas the uh, space clouds i guess you can call them some people call them that you got your asteroids you got your other stars that it would probably pass it would hit before it got to us and of course planets and so there's so many things that are a medium for it light to get through that they're saying that there's no way it's a constant out in space now it's a constant in a vacuum as long as nothing is you know interacting with it yeah that's true but you gotta understand that's a vacuum as long as nothing gets in its way like a medium for it to pass through and they actually took it and said you know what we're gonna put it to the test they went in the lab put it through a bunch of mediums and they were like holy crap we actually slowed the speed of light down to almost nothing and just by passing it through a medium and i'm not talking about they put a center block in front of it like oh look it don't go through a center block well of course it doesn't but they actually showed that speed of light can be slowed down greatly to almost dead stop or actually i think they did get to go to a dead stop in a um dense medium which brought about of course the fact well i guess the speed of light is not actually constant all the time because of these different mediums and so on and they're also finding out that the speed of light out deep space actually travels in kind of a curve line instead of a straight line and they've done this study through 27 or more binary star systems and by studying it they've come across this that um, with you this uh, framework that the light actually travels more of a curve in deep space as it gets to us instead of a straight line and by doing so it somehow refracts enough to where it gets to us a lot sooner than we think it does and um, this uh, occurs in their refractive index is what they're talking about with uh, no excuse me refractive index is the light slowing down like I said I'm getting ahead of myself um, but for the equation with the curvature and Euclidean straight line is s equals 2 times capital R times tangent negative 1 times little r divided by 2 times capital R now little r is the euclidean straight line the capital r is the radius of the curvature from the riemannian space and the reason this equation was so important when i was first of all i didn't even know it existed 
Um, I honestly did not know anything about Euclidean viewpoint, uh, curvature of Romanian space. I didn't hear any of that when I was in college. And I mean, I'm going back to college now, and I'm actually right now, my class is uh, college physics. Didn't cover it. No, nothing was said. And the Euclidean, I found out through my um, research for this, is also known as Pythagorean. And that's why I was kind of curious. I was like, how come I haven't heard about this in physics when it, this has such a major um, thing with it and it could mean a lot? But, of course, they talk about the Pythagorean theorem and so on in physics, but they don't cover how this affects their viewpoint when it comes to light and so on when it comes to physics. And it just shot. And then when I actually looked at the equations that they came out with, the you using this equation and so on. In other words, one light year in Euclidean distance would equal 0.997 years actual time. So one light year is not even one full year our time. Um, like I said, that's a distance, and they're just putting the distance and calculating it to okay, for a light. For a star that's possibly this far out, let's say one light year out, what would that be our time for the light to get to us? The light would get to us in 0.997 years. <clears throat> so in other words, a star one light year out wouldn't even take a full year for the light to get to us. Now, they went so far as, okay, here's the extreme side. 10,000 light years out, it would take a star's light 15.7 years to get to us. That's what shocked me. When I saw it, I was like, okay, so a light, a star 10,000 year, ten thousand light years away would only take 15.7 years actual time for the light to reach us? That, that's way shorter than what they assume. And so it was, it was a big shock. And I really um, suggest anybody who comes across this video, you definitely need to do some, a lot more research when it comes to this. Uh, on your own because it's pretty fascinating. Now, I want to cover this also. There are some out there that they claim, well, if the speed of light's not constant, that changes everything we know about physics. We have to throw all the physics equations out. And all. First of all, that's a lie. Okay, that is a straight up lie. And the reason I say that is I've gone through so many physics equations this term and still many I haven't gone through and that they don't even deal with the speed of light. There, I mean, there's tons of them that don't deal with speed of light. And the ones that do are more on the theoretical physics side. So I looked it up. I was like, okay, if the speed of light wasn't constant, would that really affect physics equations for scientists? And the answer was actually no, it wouldn't. And that shocked me. So I was like, okay, let me read more from what this guy is saying. And it was a science, uh, evolutionary scientist. It actually wasn't even a creationary science scientist. And he was saying that because it actually can fluctuate through mediums and so on when they do their um their big equations the theoretical physicists and so on physicists physicists and so on they actually condense the speed of light to a unit of one therefore it is non-existent so they don't have to worry about it i was like okay so wait a minute a little bit so everybody's sitting there out there yelling that well the speed of light's not constant that changes everything we knows about physics this one guy who is a evolution physicist just said it doesn't matter we condense it to a unit of one, so we don't have to worry about any equations anyway. So that kind of made you mute. And that, like I said, um, doing this research and stuff for this for these videos, that shocked me too, because I thought they used you know the the speed of light constant, and they said no, we don't even use that. We actually condense the um, down to a unit of one. So in other words, you know, like if you get ten times one, you get ten. They're like, eh, we don't even bother with it. So that was kind of shocking too, the way, and that's the way it was kind of worded in uh, the way he wrote about it that way. But yeah, it was, um, it wasn't just him too. I think I looked up probably five others that said the same thing on the evolutionary physicist side. They said, yeah, we just convert it to a unit of one so we don't have to worry about it. I'm like, wow, that's kind of shocking because so many people fretting over it and they don't even bother with it. So yeah, it, it was kind of shocking. Um, this I'll just touch on. I'm actually going to cover it in greater detail in a much later video. But paleomagnetic dating um, relies heavily on potassium argon dating, which we've already covered the problems with it and why you shouldn't use it. But it also is used um, to help with C4 dating and tectonic plate dating when it comes to that. But like I said, I'll cover that in a video in much greater detail later. I just wanted to bring it up that it is another dating method. 
um, VARV dating, V-A-R-V-E dating. Um, sedimentary clays that are are known as VARV deposits. And if you look, um, if you've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, um, or the Painted Desert, I think it was called, or the Painted Hills, something like that. It's been a while since I've done geography. I can't remember the actual name, but you'll see like the different colors of the wavy um, lines inside uh, the mountainous and hillsides, and that's a varve. One line is a varve, and many evolutionary scientists arbitrarily attune that to one year in order for that varve to occur. But it has been shown scientifically that any flooding, locally or globally, will cause multiple varves to occur in one spot. So therefore, they're not one year. It doesn't take a year for them to occur. And also, what what it is is just the finer particles are settling out. So, um, you remember the stuff you can get in the mall and that little stuff where you you grab the graph and you shake it and then you get the little sediments, the black one, the gray one, the white one, you know, whatever. And that's that's all it's doing in real life. And Thornberry covered this problem in, um, I can't remember if it was a journal entry that I looked at over the actual book, but it was in the principles of geomorphology, geomorphology I think it was on page 404. Um, he covered this problem as well. And the other thing is you have pebbles, plants, insects, and animals have all been found embedded in the varves, and some of them in the same varve. And the reason that's important is some of them, like you'll have, a plant that by the evolutionary scale went out um, in the Cambrian and is supposed to be extinct but yet right beside it is an animal that was supposed to have died in the Jurassic much later so they weren't even supposed to be together but yet there they are and of course nobody tells you that because they don't want anything to show that oh there might have been a flood or whatever so anything like I said multiple times if there's anything that will try that will even closely prove the biblical account of the flood, the biblical account of creation, there are certain people out there that are trying to keep it covered up. They don't want you to know about it. Um, more on that in a lot later video. Uh, tree, ring, tree ring dating. Sorry, couldn't talk. Um, sequoias are some of the oldest living trees apart from the Methuselah tree, which is um, estimated to be 4,500 to 5,000 years, somewhere around there. Uh, no sequoia is older than 4,000 years old. Walter Lamertz found that also found that bristlecone pines stop growing during dry summers. During rainy spring and rainy fall, they produce two or more rings a year. So what this is covering is that tree rings are not annual, but um, dry periods and wet periods within the tree's lifespan. And mostly they'll grow when it's when they're getting enough moisture from the rain, they're getting enough nutrients from the rain, and that's why they grow. They're not annual. But the thing is, they try to use this to date trees, and they might get a tree, like say one of the giant redwood sequoias, and they'll measure it out, but they can't, even if you do it this way, and it's not annual, they're saying, well, there's still there's none of them are over 4,000 years old. And even with the Methuselah tree, that is believed to be um, a little bit older than that at 4,500 years and so on. That And they kind of ignore this, but that time frame is exactly equal to the flood from the, from the Bible. So you have the flood, and then the trees and everything start growing again. That's the time frame, because you think, if you really think about it, after the flood, every um, creature and the last uh, six to eight humans... <coughs> alive were on the ark and once they got off the ark of course they weren't in america yet again they weren't in canada again and so on and so these trees were able to grow and everything unhindered nothing stopping them and nobody trying to cut them down or whatever so they grew really really big and that's why and of course as time when people started expanding and traveling and oh look we have we found land that there's no there's not a single person on so they decided to migrate and move there. I really can't blame them, especially this day and age. I like to find a, like to find a bunch of land and move there by myself. Um, buried forest strata dating. Uh, buried trees are found horizontal. Some are um, even found diagonal or vertical. These are from not only global flood, but local floods as well. Uh, they had one, I forgot the volcano. Darn, I forgot the name of the volcano now. 
but it um but anyway the volcano erupted and of course it sent mud sliding everything and when they checked it caused a lot of these trees to be found horizontally in different positions and some lower some um further up in the lake and they studied it and they were like wow this is kind of cool and but uh the tree the reason that's important is a tree even in a lake or whatever it's not going to stand straight up for millions of years while the sediment slowly climbs the tree it's going to eventually just fall over so that's why they're saying this is done by a global flood and even local floods because it will land horizontally and then as the flood keeps going of course sediments build around it quickly and it keeps it in that position peat moss dating now this one i have never heard of but i ran across it so i wrote note some quick notes down on it peat moss was um presumed to grow at a rate of one-fifth of an inch per century however it was found that peat moss actually grows two and a half inches or 6.35 centimeters a year and sometimes it grows faster than that depending on you know the different environments and so on and so again here's a dating method that nope here's how much how fast it grows we can use that as a dating method that see the peat moss this long that it took it over you know 20 centuries or whatever well they found out nope that's not right and, which is the thing with a lot of these dating methods they have a bunch of assumptions with them but they're constantly being proven wrong so um, the last one we'll cover real quick is stalactite formation and it is believed that stalactites form over very long periods of time and it takes a long time for them to um, because of just slow dripping from water it just slowly builds and slowly builds however this too has been proven wrong and they have been proven to form quite rapidly um, there's multiple examples of stalactites or lime and everything build up happening very quickly and short amount of time and I think it was World War II or World War I, I can't remember there was a subway um, I want to say it was in Great Britain or um, European country that they shut down during that time frame well they went to open back up and they had a bunch of stalactites all over the place so and they were you know fairly decent size uh, some were a couple of feet and they're like well, wait a minute these are supposed to take forever to form and yet here they are within 30 years they're all over the subway station so again it's constantly um the assumed time frame for a lot of these dating methods are by real life and real science being proven wrong but yet they use them because that's all they've got okay so uh that'll end our uh that ends all of our dating method stuff we are done with the dates we're done with the dating and please be here next time for our creation versus evolutionism video as we cover i think it is the ancient environment something like that um i have to look it up i can't remember what it is exactly but i think is we're going to be covering um in my note my next stack of notes it deals with the ancient the ancient environment prehistoric environment or something like that so be here next time for that video and hopefully these videos are helping y'all um renew your faith and trust in the word of god hoping they're renewing your faith and trust in the actual biblical creation account and the flood and hopefully y'all are able to use this to help out others in your church or community that may have questions as well so um, hopefully god will continue to use these videos to bless y'all and until next time guys god bless and i will see you then later